starts right now. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, uh, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done. And in 1956, a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it. It's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains and planes than in the 1950s, and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. The lecture was based on air pollution. In 1950, the air pollution was very high. The speaker explained that the main sources came from factories and caused illness and health problems. 4,000 deaths were recorded in London and the government introduced a new act that is called Clean Air Act in 1956 but air pollution still continues. In today's era, air pollution is caused by increased number of vehicles like car, lorries, trains, and planes. This problem is increasing because everyone is vehicle dependent, dependent. The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the ba brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills, and, and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, the relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their adults. Development and the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back and forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ, which has multiple sections that specialize in different um, uh, kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally uh, kind of well put together, and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference.
NASA has just released a new image captured by the Hubble Space Telescope, revealing what it looked like moments before galactic clusters, cosmic cl clusters that consist of many galaxies held together by gravity smashed into each other. The result of this cosmic collision of galaxy clusters was the formation of a new massive structure called Max J0416.1-2403. Or simply Max J0416 that lies roughly 4.3 billion light years from Earth in the constellation Eridanus. Pictures of galactic clusters sometimes don't look real because every single one of the tiny, stereotypically spiral disks in the image above looks an awful lot like they were just photoshopped haphazardly onto a black background. But these images are completely real and also incredible because each one of those galaxies contains billions of stars and countless planets, just like our own Milky Way contains the planets and the stars of our solar system. To create the image above, which the team is calling the Cosmic Kaleidoscope, researchers combined data captured by three different telescopes set to capture individual parts of the sky. As the team explains, the image of the cluster combines data from three different telescopes, the NASA slash ESA Hubble Space Telescope showing the galaxy and stars, the NASA Chandra X-ray Observatory diffuse emission in blue, and the NRAO Jansky Very Large Array diffuse emission in pink, each telescope shows a different element of the cluster, allowing astronomers to study Max J0416 in detail. The way a mother rat takes care of its pups is by licking and grooming, nipple switching and arch back nursing. So the rats that do a lot of licking and grooming and there are rats, rats that do very little, but most rats are in between. So that re resembles uh, human, human behavior as well, right? You have mothers that are highly mothering and mothers that couldn't care less. And most mothers are somewhere in between. So if you look at these rats, so all you do, you observe them and you put them in separate cages. So you put the high lickers in one cage, not the mothers, but the offspring, and the low lickers in another cage. And then you let them grow, and they're adults now. The mothers are long buried. And you look in the brain, and you see that those who had high licking mothers express a lot of glucocorticoid receptor gene, and those who are low lickers express very little. That reflects a number of receptors. And that results in a different stress response. But this is not the only difference. We found later on there are hundreds of genes that are differently expressed. So if you get a mutation, you know, a polymorphism once in a million, here are just the motherly love changes hundreds of genes in one shot. And it changes them in a very stable way that you can look at the old rat and you can say whether it was licked or not. But you can also say it by behavior. So if you walk to the cages, to the room, the rats that were poorly licked are highly anxious, hard to handle, aggressive. And, and the rats that were very well handled as, as, off, as little pups, they are much more relaxed, much easier to handle. So, you know, like every technician in the lab knows, looking at the adult rat, how it was licked when it was a little pup. And the question, of course, is, Mechanism. How does this work?
The lecture was based on licking and grooming. An experiment on rat about low LG and high LG, also discussed. Some mother rats spend myriad time licking and grooming and nursing their pups, but others seem to ignore their pups. Highly nurtured rat pups tend to grow up to become adults and have better ability to deal with stress and alcohol while others who receive little nurturing tend to grow up to be anxious and low ability pups. It is not genetic, it's epigenetic that shows moms spend time, even after the pups become adults, adults. Thirdly, life from non-living matter. And this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter. Okay, so we have a monkey sitting at a typewriter. And the claim here is, basically, if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life. Don't worry about it. Yes, it's strange. Yes, it's wonderful. But leave enough matter, 600 million years on Earth, and you will have life. So the monkey's sitting at the typewriter, and the chances are, eventually, he produces the complete works of Shakespeare. So what's the problem? So there's no problem, there isn't an issue, right? You just leave him long enough, you'll be fine. And at one keystroke a second, the monkey might well eventually get to the complete works of Shakespeare, but he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question, right? On average, how long is it gonna take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be, maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth isn't supposed to have emerged within? And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, which you have to have for like the life we have now, doesn't emerge in, it's, it's not like, a sentence's worth of information. A DNA string has got as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Right? So if we're saying that emerged, something of that complexity emerged by chance, undirected, within 600 million years, again, it's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have, that it tilts me in favor of the Christian story in which God creating life is simply a question of saying, let there be, and there was. The lecture was based on infinite monkey theorem and the typewriter. The speaker said that how long it takes for a monkey to write the six-letter word monkey. The monkey sitting at the typewriter, hitting a key at a random on a typewriter for 600 million years and he produces the complete works of Shakespeare. This perception is mathematically possible but not in reality. The speaker also discussed one of the Christian stories in which God creating life, creating life.
the lecture was based on air pollution. In 1950, the air pollution was very high. The speaker explained that the main sources came from factories and caused illness and health problems. 4,000 deaths were recorded in London and the government introduced a new act that is called Clean Air Act in 1956 but air pollution still continues. In today's era, air pollution is caused by increased number of vehicles like car, lorries, trains, and planes. This problem is increasing because everyone is vehicle dependent, dependent. I'm 43 years old and I owe tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. Oh sure, I knew the loans were piling up as I went through school. But with one loan coming from here, another from there, I had no idea of the rock slide that was building. Fifteen years later, I still experience moments of sheer horror regarding my family's financial situation. My monthly student loan payment is more than triple my car payment. Okay, so without my college degree, I would not have been able to get my current job. For that I am grateful, but at what cost? My loans have been accruing at a rate of 10%, and now they have burgeoned to, well, I'm an English major, you do the math. I don't think they'll ever get paid off. We're in debt way past our eyeballs, and there's no hope in sight. I'm being kept in class, a financial class of graduates whose only hope for attending college meant borrowing money from the government. Because of our mounting credit card debt and monthly payments that far exceed our family's income, my kids will also join the class of citizens who can't rely on their parents for college support. Do I wish I'd chosen another educational route? You bet. Perhaps trade school. I thought that being a plumber might not be such a bad gig. But if your job aspirations require a four-year degree, take my advice and choose a college you can afford both during and after graduation. Take a realistic look at your anticipated income and factor in priorities that don't carry a price, like the spouse and children you might want to have someday. I was overconfident that my student loan debt would pale in comparison to the lucrative writing career I'd enjoy after graduation. Now I'm paying for that decision in more ways than I'd ever imagined. Fifty percent of the world's population is vitamin D deficient, and we believe that it has serious health consequences for both children and adults alike. Major cause is lack of sun exposure. Humans have always depended on the sun for their vitamin D requirement, and it's over the past 40 years that it's been suggested that you should never be exposed to direct sunlight. That is one of the major causes of the vitamin D deficiency pandemic. Again, everybody thinks about vitamin D preventing rickets in children. We don't see rickets any longer, so people are not thinking about vitamin D. It's incomprehensible to physicians as to how vitamin D can reduce risk of heart attack by 50%, reduce risk of common cancers like colon, prostate, breast by as much as 
reduce risk of infectious diseases, including influenza, by as much as 90 percent, reducing risk of type 1 diabetes, 78 percent, if a child is getting adequate vitamin D during the first year of life, reduces risk of type 2 diabetes. This busy little town is named after St David's first cousin. It's also a Welsh language stronghold. According to the 2001 census results, 70% of the town's population could speak Welsh. But even here, the language may not be completely safe. The Welsh Language Board expects last year's census results to show a fall in the number of Welsh speakers living in its northern and western heartlands. One of the main reasons for that, the board says, is migration. Many Welsh speakers are choosing to leave the country. At the same time, only a small percentage of those moving in can speak the language or choose to learn it. Historically, over the past 70, 80 years, Welsh people have continually left in order to find better, better standard of pay, maybe, and quality of uh, employment. Uh, the thing that's changed most probably is that um, there is a larger amount of English people now who have found Wales over the last 20, 25 years, particularly this corner of Wales, and uh, regard it as a desirable place to come and live, and as opposed to many areas of England, I suppose, like the Cotswolds, cheaper as well. 